remote sensing and, and our capabilities using satellite data to, to monitor globally is, is more critical than ever. There is a combination of, um, I would say, negative um, developments that uh, makes uh, market participants very worried uh, about, the, um, about the short to near term prospects as far as global supplies are concerned. Ukraine probably exports in any year about 20% of the world's exports in corn and Russia about 2%. But together, they also form 29% of the global wheat exports, and they're probably close to 80% of the oil seed production in the globe. At NASA Harvest, we are working on integrating remote sensing data into the information that every market analyst and decision maker is looking on on a daily basis uh, to assess crises like this one. You don't want to impede uh, free flow of, 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 of grain and other agricultural products. And to the degree possible, you want to help augment uh, purchasing power for those who are most vulnerable. Prices have gone up 50% for four weeks since the conflict, right? This is huge. They, they were not ready for it. So I think there was no, there was no readiness for this type of a supply shock at this time when you have high energy, high fertilizer, high dollar. Even before this crisis emerged, uh, we had, you know, a, we're coming off of a very poor harvest in South America. Uh, we had a bad wheat harvest in North America last year, both in terms of Canada and, and the U.S. Uh, so stock levels have been uh, at, at some of the lowest levels we've seen. On top of that, you put in a volatile uh, vegetable oil market where we've had uh, record high prices for many of the oils. Uh, we have uh, some of that affected obviously by the soybean shortfalls in, in South America. So that means soybean oil prices have been up. Um, and on top of that, you have very strong demand. You know, talking about all the already tight markets and already the implications of Russia and Ukraine and the Black Sea region. And then on top of that, you know, there is, um, third consecutive dry spell in, in Eastern Africa, We've seen the droughts in South America, and that's impacting the current season as well, as well as the previous season. And so, and you look at Afghanistan, so you look at a lot of the vulnerable parts of the world, as well as the parts of the world that are large exporters, that if there's going to be less supply, those are the areas that you want to have more supply coming from. Uh, Ukraine itself is, in terms of its exports of food commodities, it's number one in sunflower oil in the world. It's number three in barley, it's number three in wheat, it's number four in corn. So it is very important in terms of uh, some of the primary commodities that people eat every day. We are closely monitoring crop conditions for winter wheat uh, in that region that is developing right now and was planted last year. That winter wheat is supposed to start being harvested soon in the Black Sea region, it would be like uh, June, July, for the uncertainty around the Actual harvest of the crop is very big for the 2021-2022 market in year. And the amounts that are actually going to get to the market to be exported are not clear either. I think the, the food system is global. And I think even more so important to have a capability to really be able to monitor at the global scale, both the big production and exporting countries, as well as those importing and most vulnerable countries. Um, given the, the, the current situation. There are some immediate impacts and there are some longer term impacts, maybe more midterm impacts that we should be concerned about. And the immediate period is through about May. And why May or June? That's because that's when the next plantings will occur in Ukraine for corn. So up until that time, we've got an issue about getting ready to plant, but we also have an issue uh, right now, there's a very tight supply globally of wheat. And that period, May to June, is when global supplies start coming back. So the United States and others would be able to start uh, feeding into the, the tight wheat market. So uh, when you're talking about food, uh, you know, that is what is known as the breadbasket of Europe. 
So that already gives you an idea that uh, there are significant uh, uh, producers, leading producers and leading exporters. Uh, among the agricultural crops that are of particular concern these days, uh, one could say is wheat. Uh, the reason being that, uh, you know, somewhere between 28 to 30 percent of the world trade actually uh, comes from these two countries. And um, adding to that, summer crop planting for those countries that to start relatively soon, um, that will be the end of April, beginning of, of May, remains uncertain. Um, Ukraine is the biggest producer of sunflower and a big player in in maize, representing 16% of global food supply. For sunflower, Ukraine exports 50% of oil. So the situation is also impacting the, the oil seed market. In terms of, of the NASA harvest capabilities, we are, of course, monitoring crop conditions as the, the season progresses. We're monitoring a range of different uh, agrometeorological indicators that are really important for tracking crop progress. But the other thing we're very concentrated on is also monitoring um, where are the crop plants? Where are the crop, the, the various crops that are being grown? Um, monitoring planted area and changes in, in planted area um, and being able to look at and, and ultimately forecast yields. And so we have developed uh, within Harvest, we have several different yield models um, that we are running for across the globe and, and across the major, both production areas, but also um, those countries that are most vulnerable to uh, food insecurity. In Egypt, the price of wheat has always been a major uh, thing to watch in terms of how people view the government and its performance. So let's watch that very carefully as well. The problem in uh, Lebanon goes back to the explosions that occurred in its port areas in, in 2020. Um, I think that was an explosion caused by fertilizers that were stored in bad conditions. They can't store much wheat anymore, so they're living hand to mouth, month to month, with their wheat imports. Yemen as well, I mean, the, the, the country is, has been torn by a civil conflict for years. People are in very poor shape malnutritionally, and in terms of their livelihoods, prices are rising. Uh, imported wheat is a uh, 16% of it normally comes from, from Ukraine. They as well are going to have to move very quickly and very decisively to make sure that they can replace that amount of wheat for, for their own food security. 50% uh, of the normal wheat imports for Mauritania come from Ukraine. So they as well are going to have to watch very closely how they are able to arrange for alternate suppliers. Uh, I really, I think this this period for me is uh, what I, I I'm I'm calling now uh, a quiet uh, food crisis. It's usually, food crises are loud. This one is very quiet, but it doesn't mean uh, that it's um, is less severe. It's probably because it's very severe. People still haven't understood it, and the places to really look into is the Middle East, North Africa. I think that's where, especially because we're talking wheat, for example, but uh, because also these regions are are suffering from probably what we could call a chronic drought. It's not like, you know, they may have one good year every four years now. So the other years is just a drought and there are big population, big dependence on imports. Uh, the good news is for, if you're looking at 2021 crop of wheat, most of that has gone out the door already. About 70% of that is probably shipped. Uh, but corn less so. I mean, we're, uh, you know, typically they export about 55% of the corn by this time of year. So there's still presumably a lot of corn still left in the country. Um, you know, we also have this issue on fertilizer. So what it ultimately means for productivity around the world. Uh, these are all big questions that I think, you know, we're going to be grappling with all year. Uh, you know, th these are not just the statistics. That means a lot of people are, are probably going to to eat, uh, you know, bad, that means not, uh, not good food or, or they just cut on consumption. The other big unknown is, is of course, what, what's gonna happen with weather. We are in a, in a La Nina um, at the moment and, and we already are seeing some dry conditions across the wheat belt in the US. Obviously it's, it's very early still in the season and, and as we know that, that can still change quite a lot. Similarly, there's some dry conditions in, um, in Europe. 
We're seeing dry conditions in, in South America. Um, and so all of that's gonna be really important for ultimately um, for, for this upcoming season. And so even without this massive disruption uh, to global food security and, and, and global production, we were already in tight markets. And I think any further disruption um, because of extreme weather um, will be a, a, a great concern. Uh, if we look at the current situation for summer crops in, in South America, for example, it's being hit by La Nina and impacted the critical stage of maize and soybean in, in February, March. Uh, and it might potentially affect the next season of wheat, the 2022-2023 market year. We know that the world is suffering with food inflation uh, all over, I would say. Almost every single country, be it uh, developed, developing, uh, low income, they all having the same problem. So this is coming on the top of that. Uh, not to mention, of course, a huge problem with energy and oil prices, and uh, big concerns about input costs such as fertilizer, which uh, in normal situations I would say you have a big demand for grains and agricultural crops, and that would trigger also a demand for fertilizers, but at these prices, perhaps not every farmer can afford it. So much has happened so quickly, but it, the important thing to remember is this is already on top of a, a pretty volatile situation in terms of world markets. I, I think the, the, the other big thing here is to realize that we're also coming off of a year of COVID where a lot of these countries have had to deal with this crisis, uh, their own crisis, and you know have spent a lot of their public funds trying to mitigate the impacts on COVID. Remote sensing and, and our capabilities using satellite data to, to monitor globally is, is more critical than ever. I think you know, this is a global crisis and, and our global food system is, is indeed global. And therefore um, we don't only have the capabilities to monitor the agricultural lands in Ukraine to monitor you know, not only what will happen in terms of spring plantings, but also in terms of what ultimately will production look like um, and, and crop conditions there and, and, and in Russia, um, but also to monitor the conditions in the countries that are the biggest importers and those that are reliant on uh, grains coming from, from the Black Sea region, as well as those countries that might be able to fill the gaps and the, the, the other countries that are really important for um, the wheat and, and corn markets, whether that's the US or Canada or, or South America or Argentina, um, Australia. We monitor crop condition, evapotranspirative index, uh, NDBI, temperature, soil, moisture, planting and harvest progress. Are, those are monitored and reported monthly in the crop monitor reports and weekly in the AGMED tool platform and in the GLAM system but also inspired in, in another rapid response initiative from last year, the NASA Harvest COVID dashboard, our team developed a very complete dashboard with the latest information on crop conditions, food security, crop prices, import and export data, input prices such as fertilizer, for example, energy prices such as natural gas, oil prices. Uh, we have data on inflation, foreign exchange rates for different countries and climate prediction. These are global markets, so globally prices are going up. So it's not just, you know, it, 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 it's just to say that the, that's why we're interested in crop production everywhere, you know, not just, not just what's going on in, in uh, uh, Eastern Europe right now. It's, it's uh, tight markets, and uh, that's why it's precisely in those uh, periods when information is so critical um, and, and that information moves markets. Nobody can predict how this is all going to unfold and what the ultimate consequences are going to be. But I think what we do know is that it's going to be absolutely critical to be able to maintain market transparency and to provide global, timely, and reliable information on major staple food crops. Um, and for the remote sensing community to be working very closely with the policymakers, with the policy community, with the market analysts, with the humanitarian organizations. Um, in order to be able to fill gaps of information and to make sure that the information we're providing is information that's needed in order to inform some of these critical decisions.